Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today's guests are Janie Day, Interim President and CEO of Feeding Westchester, Nancy Keel, President and CEO of Second Harvest Food Bank of Middle Tennessee, and Michelle Organ, President and CEO of Second Harvest Food Bank of Southern Wisconsin. Thank you for joining us, panel, and a reminder to our webinar guests that you can ask questions to the Q&A and chat functions at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to cover those topics during the show or afterwards. Thank you all for attending uh, the, the uh, webinar, and this issue of food banks is so important. We've all seen in the newspapers how during the uh, coronavirus pandemic that you have all been incredibly impacted. Uh, let's go around the table and just talk a little bit about the scale of your operations, and then let's delve into some of the uh, need that you're filling right now. Starting with you, Janie, uh, could you talk a bit about your role as the interim director? And you have a very, very long history of leadership of, of uh, food banks across the country as well. Uh, could you talk a little bit about your operation in Feeding Westchester? Absolutely. Um, thank you for having me on today and for talking about some of the issues all food banks are facing across the country. Uh, I've been at Feeding Westchester as the interim director since March the 12th. And on the day that I um, actually arrived, we were on the phone with the governor because he had just shut down New Rochelle and isolated that area. And we needed to respond very quickly the next day to make sure that children were fed who were out of school. So we hit the ground running on March the 12th, on the first day I arrived, and we haven't stopped since. Feeding Westchester serves uh, one county, which is about a million people in Westchester, uh, New York. And it has a variety of different cities, White Plains, Yonkers, Port Chester, um, those kind of things that people have heard of before. We have a food insecurity rate on a regular basis of about 250,000 people. But today we are feeding double that. We are close to feeding 500,000 people. In any one year, our food bank would move about 11 million uh, pounds of food. But to date, we have already moved close to 15 million and are on track to distribute about 16 million at the end of June. It's so important to note, you're, you're north of New York City, which was yes. the epicenter of, of this virus. And you were very heavily impacted. And so you end up with double the, the uh, constituency to serve, which in a, even a good year, uh, your services are a phenomenal relief, but an inadequate relief in comparison to the need. And now the need is twice as high. Uh, Nancy, talk a little bit about what you're finding at the, at the Second Harvest uh, Food Bank in your area. Um, well, for, uh, for us, I think everybody knows that we started this perfect storm with a tornado that hit a couple of our counties, um, which was very damaging. And not even a week later, then COVID comes in. So for us, it's this perfect storm of disaster on top of disaster. Um, we've got 46 counties that we serve, uh, which represents about 350,000 food insecure individuals. And that was pre the pandemic. I think Janie just mentioned that they've seen increases. We've seen at least a 50% increase in the need. Um, and the uh, opportunity for us is we've seen a decrease in the food that we've received um, as far as donations. So we're having to purchase significantly more food, which is costing us quite a bit of additional money to make sure that we can feed those additional, let's say there's 175,000 additional individuals that are food insecure. Um, we've had to change quite a bit of our, our model. We've had to evolve substantially um, from how we've gotten food to individuals with the pandemic because there's so many people that are stuck at home or don't have transportation and there's, you know, our lines have increased uh, substantially. So for us, it has been um, everybody coming together in very unique collaborative ways to make sure that we can get our food insecure population um, served. And we feel that this is gonna be something that we're gonna be working on for a, quite a long time before we're gonna see things shift differently. And it's so important to note you in, um, in, in the center of Tennessee with uh, the, the tornado that hit and then the virus that hit, Tennessee has basically been a leader in response to coronavirus, but uh, these dual uh, impacts 
have created huge need. And it's, it's important to note that Jamie was the previous uh, chief executive and you, Nancy, are her successor. So those commonalities of needs and the expertise required to, to address those across the, the nation is also very important to the constituents that you serve. Michelle, when, when you're talking about um, your situation in, in southern Wisconsin, um, how, does your, how does your experience map to uh, Janie's experience and Nancy's experience during this time? You know, there are 200 Feeding America food banks in the network. We cover every county in the whole United States. We're all different sizes, but we're all experiencing a lot of the same things. Um, this is the third food bank I've been at in the network over the past 20 years. And we um, generally, when there's, you know, when Nancy said they experience a tornado, when we experience a, a disaster in normal, in normal times when there's not a pandemic, food banks come to each other's aid and we will send, um, We'll send resources, we'll send food, we'll send uh, staff, we'll, we'll send uh, money to, to different, um, our, our, our sister food banks and other areas. And that, that can't happen now. We're all experiencing the same, same challenges. Um, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're, all, we're all seeing a lot of the same, different versions of the same, same types of challenges. You know, we serve 16 counties here in southwestern Wisconsin. And since March 15th, we've, sir, we've provided nearly 3 million meals. And in a normal year, we, we top out about 14 million meals. And that's, so in, in just a couple of months, it's been, it's been 3 million meals. We, um, we serve, our, our food insecurity numbers were about 100, 100 103,000 people before um, the pandemic. And we're expecting that post pandemic during the recovery, we're gonna be serving about 165, 170,000 people. Um, the food insecurity rate's gonna go up. So there's the, the current um, spike um, that we're seeing, and then there's the recovery period. So it's, it's not, once, once this is over, it's not over for the people we serve. And the challenges we're facing are that, you know, right now during, during the, um, the, 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 the current time and you know we've got we've got more work we're serving more people more people are you know when school when schools were canceled all the kids that were receiving free and reduced lunch aren't aren't receiving that um, the um, so we've got more work we're serving more people um, we have more challenging work with social distancing and the inability to have the same type of operations um, that has 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 changed how we do things where a lot of us are moving to uh, pre-packed boxes, which changes our whole way of operating. And it's become uh, a more expensive, higher cost to how we do work. Uh, the supplies that we use, you know, there are the, the boxes that we put food in cost money and as, as a very simple, one, one very simple thing of what, what we have to think about that adds almost a dollar to every box cost that we're, we're doing. We, have to, we can't reuse boxes. We wanna make sure things are safe and, and, and new. And, um, you know, we've had, we've hired here 15 temporary staff to help us with things. We can't use our own warehouse to pack things. We are using um, the uh, Alliant Energy Center. It's a big event space. So we have offsite operations and we have fewer resources. Food donations are down because there's less surplus at grocery stores. And that's something we depend on at food banks. And there are fewer volunteers to help us out. So all these things, in addition to, to the need increasing, there's just our whole way of operating for all food banks has had to shift overnight and change fatigue, just all the things that are going on are, are, are a challenge for us. But everybody's coming together and it's been amazing to see what, what's been going on, but it's not, it's not over when, when things get better. Let's start breaking down some of these issues, starting with the, the, um, the issue that, that you mentioned, Nancy, in terms of the supply chain. And uh, Michelle, you also talked about the supply chain. Uh, talk about where your food comes from under normal circumstances. And then, let, then let's delve into the disruptions that you're suffering. Um, so Nancy, where does your food come from generally? Well, typically our food, and it continues to come from uh, grocery stores, manufacturers, farmers. And I think all three of us will tell you they come from anybody that has food we try to find a way to get that food donated to us. Um, the transportation logistics are quite complicated and you, you either have to supply the, the logistics, organize logistics, or uh, hope that the donor uh, can supply the logistics to just get the food to your facilities, right? 
Right. Well, from the grocery stores, uh, we pick those up. So we've got a fleet of 19 trucks. So we're out at 200 plus grocery stores picking that up on a weekly basis. And I think Michelle just mentioned it that, um, you know, our grocery store uh, donations are down substantially just because they don't have food on their shelves. And it's a glitch in the supply chain that we hope is going to right itself over time. It just takes a while to, to get back on track. But the same thing goes for the food that we're trying to purchase. Supply chain is just backlogged. So us trying to find peanut butter or chunk chicken or uh, mac and cheese, we couldn't get our hands on that for a while. And it's slowly starting to come back and, and be available to us. So until the supply chain rights itself, we're going to continue to be in this issue with the amount of donated food we can get access to and also the types of purchased food um, that, that we need to have available to us. I will say one positive thing that has, has come out of this with the, the changes, we immediately started going to, everything was boxed, everything, people would pop their trunk, we'd put the box of shelf-stable food in their trunks. Well, we immediately realized that we also need to make sure nutrition is part of that, so we started building our own produce boxes. And that became a part of our delivery system. So uh, we're making sure that before we had like a produce truck where people could come get fresh produce. We're just finding new ways, uh, new logistical ways to get that fresh produce to those, that, uh, those people that we serve. How do you deal with uh, social distancing issues, Janie, where you have, you're in a, you're in a virus epicenter, uh, certainly in uh, loading and unloading trucks, uh, people are engaging in physical work and, and there are often uh, groups of people doing it together. And then when you move your goods through the warehouse, again, there are groups of people who have to collaborate. Um, and then when you're packing um, food in boxes, again, it's very difficult to create. I mean, you can't work in a plexiglass shield enclosed uh, area, right? How, how do you deal with that? Absolutely. Well, we've been very fortunate in Westchester um, because we stopped um, having volunteers from the public come into our warehouse. We have a sm much smaller warehouse than Second Harvest does in Nashville. And, and we were very conscious of the social distancing. So we actually have had the National Guard with us since day one, which has been fabulous. And we've had the same team. And so that has really helped us to be able to continue to either pack boxes, pack produce, pack protein boxes, pack non-perishable food boxes, um, whatever type of uh, delivery we're going to do. But we also have very strict sanitation of drivers, gloves, masks, hand sanitizer, washing your hands, all of those things we're very conscious of and we implemented. One of the first things that we did though was we took 50% uh, of our staff and moved them off site. And so the, what I would call essential, essential truck drivers, warehouse personnel, volunteer coordinators, they all stayed in the building and operations uh, so that we could continue to move food very quickly. But other folks like fundraising, accounting, uh, communications, they moved off site but continued to work. That way, if we had team A go down, we had team B that could come back in and hopefully fill in some of those slots. We were not immune to having um, employees also contract the virus. Over five of our employees during this time and two um, National Guardsmen have contracted the virus. None were hospitalized, but um, all had to be off. So we've had to hire additional personnel that cost money. You have to have temporary drivers, temporary warehouse, et cetera. I think all of us, all three of us have probably faced that as well as you continue the work because since it's doubled, you almost have to have additional staff to be able to make these things happen. And you really don't have any choice because if you don't provide the nutrition, particularly for, for young people where school is suspended and they depend on that school day to supply them with food, are, are, are we going to really let kids in our community starve? I mean, that's, right. that's, that's the issue, right? Uh, let's right. talk a little bit about uh, some of what you all have, have talked about, which is how members of the public, um, farmers, uh, uh, members of the business community who supply uh, some of your uh, food, um, uh, other uh, members of the National Guard um, have come together to, to help. 
Uh, Michelle, in, in, in your environment, um, how is that functioning? How are you coordinating the various uh, contributions and the willingness of, of different constituents uh, to give either in treasure or in terms of, of physical support? Well, we've been um, able to work with a lot of volunteers. We've had to we've had to move to a seven day a week operation and have extended hours so that we can accommodate volunteers. People still want to help, but we need to make sure it's safe for them. We need to make sure that we stagger orientation times when they come in and training. We can't have a group of 15 people come in at the same time to get trained. Um, when the shift starts, everybody has to wash their hands before they start and and they can't all wash their hands at the same time at the same in the same area. It takes a lot longer to get a shift going, and um, and so we have uh, multiple sites, multiple shifts, multiple times, and so it's it takes longer to get the work done because we have to spread it out a lot farther. So making it safer for volunteers, letting them know um, uh, how to be safe, and making sure that that we're, we're keeping them safe, having taped out areas on the floor so that there's social distancing and continuing to remind people, just making sure it's safe because people do want to help. People do, do want to volunteer and they, they, want, they want to do something. People, even though they're, they, they're not maybe uh, working in the traditional sense or working from home or they, 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 still, they still want to give back, it makes them feel better to do something. And so we've been able to help them help them do that. Um, there are a lot of, of people who've asked how they can help and you know we've we've had a total unbudgeted amount that we've spent um, uh, since March 15th to meet the need of 1.6 million dollars um, on top of what we would normally be spending in this in this time and that takes a lot of community support and along the way people have asked us well what do you do if if you don't have the money, like we have no choice. We just have to, we just have to keep going and we get to have to operate on the assumption that it's going to be there for us and that we're going to, we're going to, we, we have to go out on a, on a, on a limb and out on faith because there's no other option. We're the only ones. There's, there's nobody else. And if we don't do it, it's not going to get done. Um, and people have really responded to that. And it's, we've been able to keep up with, with what we need to do and the resources have, have kept up with us. Um, you know, farmers and others have been really struggling in Wisconsin. There's a lot of a lot of focus on the fact that um, dairy farmers have had to dump milk, and it's and and farmers have not had the ability to to get their food to market. And something creative that we've done here is there's some federal um, CARES Act money that has come into at least one of our counties, um, the the county that we're located in, our our headquarters here in Dane County, and we've been um, creatively using some CARES Act money. To, uh, to find a way to support farmers and, uh, and uh, meat, dairy, and produce uh, uh, producers um, and farmers in our area. And it's, it's been, um, we've got, we're starting to gear that up to be able to make sure that the money we're spending on food, because we have to spend money on food. And so some of that money that we're gonna be spending on food is going to go to support farmers because we don't want to have to feed farmers with the money, <laughs> you know, like it would be better for us to be able to use this value add and to be able to support farmers by buying food from them so they can stay afloat and help us feed the rest of the community. So that's been really exciting for us to be able to do. And they already are donors to us. They already give to us throughout the year. And this is our ability to try to help them stay afloat because without them, if, if they go down, then we don't have the food at any other time of the year. So it's been a really great thing to see. And that's the virtuous circle, right, where we're helping each other. Carol Corwin, uh, Corwin um, uh, asked, asked a couple questions and made a few points. She noted that uh, she works with pharma groups and, um, and she has noted that many of, of those constituents have not received uh, funding from the government that was uh, promised. She also asked about the $3 billion USDA coronavirus food assistance program and whether uh, you all have, have received any help uh, from that program. Uh, Nancy, uh, Janie, Michelle, have you received any of that money to support your efforts to feed Americans? Um, yes, we actually have. Um, the program just started though about two weeks ago. The bids went out about three or four weeks ago. They just completed them. Um, really in the early stages, we've been getting produce boxes through that particular program. Um, but I will say at this point, it's still quite confusing. There are a lot of folks that still aren't sure whether they qualify to be a vendor or not. Um, 
there's still a lot of unanswered questions. So we don't know about the success of that program, I would say at this particular time. But I was gonna say in New York State, in regard to farmers, one of the things that the governor did was called Nourish New York. And he allocated $25 million to go to the food banks throughout the state to support local farmers in their communities or throughout the state, like the dairy industry, the beef industry, the fishing industry, et cetera. And so that has been invaluable to us in New York State to really help us overcome the cost because as we all three of us have said, we're having to buy more food. We're spending about 800,000 to a million dollars a month just on food. And um, that's unusual for us when we normally spend only maybe 250,000 a year. So, you know, it, it's gone up considerably. And Nancy, have you, uh, have you been able to benefit from this uh, USDA program that Carol was talking about? Yeah, so um, I think there, there is some confusion out there because I think a lot of people have asked me, like, are we getting that money, the $3 billion allocated? It is not money that's coming to food banks, they're food boxes. There's four different boxes that are coming to us. And as Janie mentioned, it has been a, a very interesting process. We're only in the first phase. Um, so for us, we said, I think we could receive for this first two months, like almost 5 million pounds. So far, we've been awarded about 35% of that. And it has come in uh, produce boxes, uh, some uh, milk, and we've gotten very little of the meat that we are hoping to get. So again, it's gonna go through December and we know that it's gonna to continue to evolve and improve, but we are seeing some of that food come in and, and we obviously could take substantially more as I'm assuming Janie and Michelle could as, as well. Um, and then the other money that started out, I think it was $19 billion or whatever, that is the money that's rolling to the farmers. And I don't have a clue how that's being allocated. We're just tracking how we get those food boxes. Right. Yeah, we're starting to see some of those, um, we call them CFAP, um, <laughs> the uh, CFAP uh, boxes coming in. Um, it's still early there, um, you know, it took us a minute to figure out how to box up food. So it's gonna take the, the vendors a minute to figure out that as well. And, um, and there's a lot of logistics involved. And uh, the original idea was that the food would come, go from the vendor to the agency or to the consumer, but we're, we're figuring out that it needs to come to us. It's just easier to do that. I think there's, there's some, there was some, there's some great ideas, but the execution of them, um, we just have to figure that out because it's, it's, it's really, it's a really, it's the right thing to do. We just have to figure out how to get it done the right, <laughs> in, in the right way. And, um, you know, there, I, I think states, um, including Wisconsin, it sounds like other states as well, are starting to, to start enact, enacting some funding um, for, for farm, farmers and supporting farmers and supporting food security. It's, it's, you know, without food, nothing else works. And I, I think it's, it's a long haul and, uh, and I, I, I'm glad to see it happening, but, you know, it's, we're, we're, you know, a couple months into this, we're more than a couple months into this. And, uh, you know, it's, it, I'm, food banks, we're all, we're all real scrappy, innovative <laughs> improvisers. And we were, we were there on day one and now people are catching up with us. And finally, I'm glad people are catching up with us because we had to figure it out. And, um, and, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm glad because the resources need to be there for a long time, but, um, you know, I, we were all calling each other saying, what are you doing? What are you doing if, the, if there's a stay at home order? How are you doing this? I was calling, you know, people in other states that had, had closed down before ours did and saying, well, how do you handle this? What are you doing if there's, a, if you're, are you considered essential? And that's, that's just how we work. We just figure it out in too many else. We figure it out first and then everybody catches up with us. And that's, that's, that was a great thing to see and have colleagues that helped out. The thing that is so striking here is that this is a crisis that really started in middle of March for um, everyone who is supplying people in need, right? The, the coronavirus um, uh, gained steam in, from the middle of January uh, through February and really hit at the, in the middle of March. So we're talking nine weeks, nine weeks, and we're talking about increases of 100% in need. It really is laying bare a systemic issue that we have in this country, that, we're, we're, that we as a country are living so close to the edge that in nine weeks, we could be thrown into this kind of a situation. 
do you see this crisis and the experience of having lived through this crisis having a sustained impact on your operations and your perspectives and the perspectives of your people in terms of food bank operations and how you will structure yourself going into the future? Um, and uh, why don't we start with you, Janie? Do you, do you see a, a significant sustained change coming out of this? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, um, I think one of the biggest things that we've discovered during this time is how in the future are we going to continue to deliver food to those in need? Right. Maybe the way that we did it before is not going to work. And so we've had to actually change our model. I think Nancy talked about that a little bit and maybe Michelle, but we all have had to look at the way that we distribute food, the way that we receive food um, and, and the agencies that we work with. I think that's really critical. At Feeding Westchester, we lost 80 agencies. We had about 300 and we lost 80 right off the back that closed and may not ever open again. But we have found new partners throughout this crisis that want to help. New organizations have popped up, new church groups, uh, municipalities have stepped in where other agencies have closed down. We used to allow agencies to order off of a list of inventory items that we had in our warehouse, but we don't have those all of those inventory items today. But we still want to feed good, nutritious food, move it out to the public. And so what we've done is we're packing pallets of produce, pallets of protein, pallets of non-perishable food items, and then we move those directly to the agency and their volunteers and staff then distribute that out to their clientele, whether it's in an open air market type setting or within their individual building, depending on the size, et cetera, and hours that they're open. Um, I think our staffing is going to change. And it, but how many people do we need in-house now versus how many people could work from home? Right. Um, you know, those kinds of things. I think we're looking at all of that. We have learned that we need more volunteers in the future. And we're going to change the way that we uh, bring volunteers in, we get them engaged, and we offer more opportunities for that. So for us, it's changing a lot of the business model that we previously had, and we're having to, you know, kind of flip and, and adjust to that. You know, we're, like Nancy said in the very beginning, we're looking at long term. This is not a short term solution. We are meeting the local needs right now, but we're looking 18 months, 24 months out to recover. This is probably the seventh or eighth disaster, national disaster I've worked in, um, whether it be a hurricane or a tornado or a flood. And now this affects all of us, as Michelle said. So we really have had to um, um, adjust our way of thinking uh, of how we do things, but we know that this recovery is not coming soon. It is a long term. So can we sustain this? And I think that's a big question for all of us is sustainability. Do we have the donors to help us? Do we have the staffing? Do we have the food? All of those are critical components to us continuing our work. And very briefly, um, Nancy, because we're running out of time, uh, Nancy, Michelle, could you each jump in in terms of your observations of sustained change in the sector? Yeah, I'll be, I'll be brief on it. For, when I think about, you know, Middle Tennessee, um, we had uh, our numbers, I told you earlier, were 350,000 food insecure individuals. And that's when our unemployment was around three to 4%. Our unemployment now has jumped to over double digit numbers. So we know that, you know, our need has increased substantially. And until those unemployment numbers go down, we are going to have, our lines are going to get longer and longer. And so we will just continue to look at that and work with our community in every way possible to lift people up so we do shorten the lines. Um, but as Janie mentioned, this is not short term. I mean, this is, when you look at the last recession that we had, uh, the information shows that it took 10 years to get to pre-recession food insecurity numbers. I don't necessarily feel like it's gonna take us 10 years but it sure is gonna take us a long time to figure this out because it has impacted every single zip code. And Michelle? Um, two things, uh, how we do our work. Somebody, something I heard recently was you can't steer it unless it's moving and we're moving and we're gonna steer our ship a little differently. We have uh, 
we're, we're already having to change things. There's no going back to what we had pre-COVID. So we're, we're gonna change how we do things um, and, and, take, and take advantage of the opportunities we have. And also how people see us and how people see our work. There's always been this argument that's really bothered me about hand up versus handout, and both are important. Hand up is not, or handout is not a bad thing. It's, it's got such a, 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 a negative connotation. When you give people food, it gives them an opportunity. If people don't have food, nothing else, nothing else works. Hunger makes everything harder. And if you can give people food, it helps them get, get everything else everything else works better. And I think people are, are seeing what food banks do, what our role is. And when, when, people, when more people are in the situation of they just need food, I think it strikes them that, it's, that food really is a basic need and people need it. And I, I'm really hoping that, that that shift happens in our country, that, that food, food, is, food is something people need. And it's a basic right that, that we, we can't just keep doing hand up versus hand out arguments. And the shift in our country is manifest. What we're seeing in red state, blue state, it doesn't matter. We're actually addressing these problems in very consistent ways. We're coming at these problems as Americans with our amazing ability to improvise, to build the bicycle while we're riding it. Panel, thank you so much for sharing your experience in the food banks. And, and thank you so much for your optimism and your work at home. That's the nonprofit report for this week. And thank you attendees for all attending. Have a great day.